Good evening everyone and welcome back to First Doma Women's Group Meeting. It's hard to believe that it's a year now since we last were able to meet together. And at that meeting a year ago, my brother from Canada was our guest speaker. Well, he has agreed to speak again this year and he has recorded a message from his home in Canada. He lives near Niagara Falls and he is a retired Presbyterian minister. And the subject of his talk is No Need to Fear. I want to send greetings to you from Canada. Uh, my name is Clyde Irvine and my claim to fame, at least in Oma, is that I'm a brother to Margaret Cummings. And some of you may remember that in March last year, um, I spoke uh, to your group, your Presbyterian women's group, about the topic of respect. And just a few days later, I flew back to Canada just as the COVID-19 pandemic was closing down huge sections of the world. And like you, I've been living through the pandemic ever since. Well, Margaret is uh, always looking for people to uh, speak during COVID times to present something to your Presbyterian Women's Group. And she invited me to do that this time. So here I am. And I speak to you from looking out the window at piles of snow. It's uh, late February and the snow is beginning to recede and our temperatures today are above uh, freezing point uh, uh, and so the snow will melt and from this point on winter will begin to recede but we won't see um, any signs of spring I doubt until towards the end of May or, or sorry end of March which is another month by which time you will be well on with spring. At any rate I'm glad to join you and I'm going to um, speak this evening on the topic well let me introduce the topic by reading a verse of scripture that will be familiar to many of you. And it's a simple verse of scripture, uh, at least it's a, not a simple one, but it's one that's uh, straightforward and short. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 we read this verse. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever. I decided a month or two ago to write uh, an article based on that verse and it will be published next week here in Canada in the Presbyterian magazine uh, that everybody reads across the country and I thought I would share it with you in Ireland. My brother Ian, recuperating from COVID-19, continues to cope with cancer in his home in Kent, England. Similar grim situations are currently being endured across the globe, accompanied, at least here in Canada, with an increasingly darker mood. In the early months of the coronavirus, coronavirus the pandemic, we heard here, various of our politicians say things like, we're all in this together. But since, in spite of guidelines discouraging non-essential travel, some of our politicians enjoyed international holidays over Christmas, we're clearly not all in this together. It is therefore no surprise that it's proving difficult for politicians to now keep convincing the public to stay home and to follow guidelines that limit freedom of movement. To make matters worse, though vaccines to combat COVID-19 are now available, the pace of vaccination here in Canada has been slow, leading in this second year of pandemic to a troubling loss of certainty about the future. Of course, the future has always been and always will be uncertain, as the Apostle Paul wrote many, many centuries ago. We walk by faith and not by sight. And yet, true as that is, most of us, most of the time, walk into the future we can't yet see with a good deal of confidence. But that's not quite true in 2021. Though we hope that global and national economies will survive the coronavirus, the coronavirus 
and that new vaccines will protect us from the virus's many mutations. We're not quite certain. Sensing that outcomes aren't as reliable as we once thought them to be. Meanwhile, most of us can't go to work, go to school, operate a business, eat out, go to a concert, attend public worship, or even meet with friends. And sadly, I'm not able to visit my brother in England, nor my sister Margaret in Ireland. If I sound negative, let me counteract that by celebrating the massive commitment undertaken by all those working to alleviate our uncertainties. Researchers who have swiftly developed new vaccines. The unceasing dedication of frontline healthcare workers. The huge efforts made by governments to mitigate financial hardship. The adaptivity and orderliness of food supply chains. And not least, the sacrificial ways in which the great majority of people have respected and endured restrictions. Compassion and concern for others has made the pandemic more bearable than it would otherwise be. Yet we're haunted by the gnawing fear that life may not soon or ever return to normal. In view of how untethered and unpredictable life now seems, Christians rightly seek a word from God that will be a lamp to our uncertain feet and a light to our unprecedented path. I confess, however, that the first biblical words that come to my mind reinforce rather than remove my fears of the future. I think of that repeated cry found in the book of Ecclesiastes, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Or I think of Jesus calling the man foolish who, having built his house upon sand, later saw it destroyed by floods and winds. And then there's that bleak word, wilderness, that shows up repeatedly in the gospel accounts of John the Baptist, who warns his generation of its need to repent. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all of them report that to hear John, people had to leave their comfort, their convenience and their certainties behind and head out into the wilderness, a fierce, forbidding location that Jews back then tried hard to avoid. In fact, they still do. When I visited Israel, we travelled in an air-conditioned bus, but getting out, going outside of the bus into the wilderness, we always have to be very careful to be with someone in scorching heat and to carry water. And yet it must also be said that the wilderness had often been the very place where God met the people of Israel and renewed Israel. And so it proved to be, again, in the days of John the Baptist, for it was in the Judean wilderness where people had to leave their normal lives behind that they were able to hear God's word from John's lips. If so, maybe our fear that all our human resources may not be able to rid us of COVID-19 will lead us to find our ultimate hope for the future not in human resources and human comforts, beneficial though they are, but in God. Biblical words like vanity, foolish, and wilderness suggest the need for us to rethink and reevaluate our lives. But the God whom we call shepherd and who we call Father, surely has more encouraging words for us in this moment. And if you think about it, the Bible is full of such words. The one word that's been on my mind in recent days is the word anchor. Though it appears in the New Testament only once, and that's where I read it in Hebrews chapter 6. 
It's a positive word, and it was a positive word back then that was widely used to symbolise hope. And in fact, the symbol of an anchor was used in the early centuries of the Christian church. Today, the word anchor isn't as popularly used by Christians, though I was introduced to the word anchor at the age of eight by the Boys' Brigade in Ballyrooney, County Down. The Boys' Brigade, as you well know, is an organisation with its roots in the muscular Christianity of late Victorian Britain. The BB has faded now in Canada, but it remains strong in Ulster, where I grew up. Its emblem, of course, is the anchor. And its motto, Stead and Steadfast and Sure, comes from the BB hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? A hymn that I remember singing lustily with the Boys Brigade Company. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. That anchor symbol, the sure and steadfast words that are the uh, motto of the Boys Brigade and the hymn are all based on the New Testament sole use of the word anchor in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. We have this hope, a sure and certain anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner of, on our behalf, has entered. The word anchor that the Boys Brigade and so many other generations of Christians have found meaningful seems so applicable and appropriate and appealing in the face of our current pandemic. Its striking use in Hebrews 6 makes the point that if a ship can be saved, protected and preserved from storms so long as it's tethered to the massive weight of an anchor, so can those who face the storms of life, including a pandemic storm, who are tethered to Jesus. Among the lessons that the coronavirus pandemic is teaching us is that human life is less certain than we'd like it to be. Ours is, we imagine, an advanced technological world, and yet it's a world of limits with limited health resources, limited financial resources, limited scientific and, and medical knowledge, limited time, and even, I might add, limited hope. But in forcing us to acknowledge life's uncertainties and limits, the current pandemic offers us the opportunity to discover that Jesus is, as Hebrews 6 claims, and as the Boys Brigade hymn celebrates, an immovable anchor whom no storm or pandemic can dis dislodge or destroy. Throughout his short life, Jesus endured, as you know, terrible temptations and trials. He was abandoned by both the justice system of his day as well as his closest disciples. And he finally endured the suffering and shame of the cross. However, and this is the claim that underpins all of Scripture and all of our Christian sacraments and songs. It's this, that God raised Jesus up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. That's a quotation from Acts chapter 2, verse 24. This staggering claim about the rising of Jesus from the death so seized the disciples who had abandoned him that they were totally transformed by it, ready to die in order to witness to Jesus, the Lord of life. It's that same staggering claim about the risen Jesus that led the author of Hebrews 6 to liken him 
to an anchor who tethers us to God. Mm. Now, at least two points flow from the above assertion. First, this. Christians need an anchor. Because we are not spared life's storms. This may seem obvious to you. And yet some Christians keep hoping for the sort of divine preferential treatment that will mean that they will never have to face a storm, that they will somehow be able to escape the storms that come down on the rest of humanity. Our faith, they say, will save us from having to endure trouble. In response to such thinking, I simply note that there's little in the Bible to support it and a great deal to contradict it. After all, what prompted the author of Hebrews 6 to apply the image of anchor to Jesus was surely the fact that Christians at that time, suffering severe hostility from the Roman Empire, needed to know that in their uncertain, insecure times, they were anchored to God through Jesus. And secondly, Hebrews chapter 6, which I just read, points those living in unsecure, un uncertain times, not to general doctrines about God's love or God's sovereignty, vital though such doctrines are, but the text leads us specifically back to the accomplished, ongoing ministry of Jesus. This is what the book of Hebrews articulates. As God's incarnate Son, through whom God has spoken to us, Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, says Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. And he was made like his brothers and sisters in every respect, says Hebrews 2.17, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. And goes on, uh, Hebrews 4 goes on to say, Jesus in every respect has been tested as we are, and then finally offered himself for our sins, Hebrews 7.27. The book of Hebrews goes out of its way to celebrate what the crucified, risen, and, and exalted Jesus means to us in these words. He's our sure and steadfast anchor. Having entered the inner shrine behind the curtain, a forerunner on our behalf. Now, the words, the inner shrine behind the curtain in Hebrews 6 might sound very obscure to you. But to those who know the Old Testament well, those words, the inner shrine of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, to which Hebrews makes reference, was back then known as the Holy of Holies. On the Day of Atonement, only held once annually, the Jewish high priest was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies, the inner shrine, and there to make a sin offering in that shrine for the sin of the nation, in a shrine that was a separated place behind the curtain, in the temple, which was then understood to be God's earthly dwelling place. So why does the book of Hebrews chapter 6 mention such Old Testament details? Because its author sees the Jewish sacrificial system as preparatory for the infinitely superior sacrificial ministry of Jesus, who sacrificed not animal blood, but his own, who sacrificed for sin obtained eternal redemption, such that no other sacrifice for sin would ever again be needed, and who entered not the Holy of Holies behind the curtain in Jerusalem's temple, a sanctuary made by human hands, but who entered heaven itself, where he now appears in the presence of God on our behalf, securing anchorage for us. The Hebrews 6 image of Jesus as our anchor, though it appears only once, lies within a larger discussion in the book of Hebrews 
of Jesus' role as the one who mediates the gulf between sinful humans like us and the Holy God. Jesus thus links, connects us, tethers us to God, just as an anchor links or connects or tethers a ship to a firm foundation. This anchoring ministry of our mediator Jesus is further elaborated by the word forerunner in Hebrews 6.20. Just as an advanced party of forerunners might go ahead to ensure that it's safe for the rest of an army to move forward, so Jesus, our forerunner, opened up, pioneered, or cleared for us a way to God. Having overcome all temptation, and having conquered the power of both sin and death, being both fully God, but also fully human, the exalted Jesus thus represents us before God. Anchored to him, we can know peace and confidence, even in a world, a shaky world that feels shaky right now, which makes us fearful and uncertain. For months now and for months to come, we will no doubt join millions of others around the globe who pray that the coronavirus pandemic will be wiped out by a combination of social distancing, good health practices and appropriate vaccines. And we will be encouraged by the fact that our world has faced larger pandemics in the past and has recovered. But as we wait, we ought also to be reassured that God is for us and not against us. And that we need fear neither the God of the universe nor the crises that come our way. For Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our anchor and our forerunner, who has redeemed us and is in the process of restoring us, tethers us to a God without limits, in whom we are forever secure, steadfast and safe. I close with some words from a song written by Graham Kendrick, a song titled No Need to Fear. And I came across this song beautifully sung by Sylvia Burnside, who lives in County Antrim. In the YouTube version of this song, I found her being accompanied by the New Irish Choir and Orchestra, and it was recorded in St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. The words, I won't sing it, but the words go like this, at least some of the words. No need to fear when times of trouble come. Oppression storm beats at your door. No need to fear. No need to fear, though evil seems so strong. Their pride and power is not for long. Be still, my soul, and trust in God, and place your life into his hands. For he will never fail you, and in the morning you'll see his face. No need to fear. Don't fear. Well, I hope you enjoyed that talk, and I trust that you find his words encouraging as we continue to wait for the end of this pandemic. Next month is are going to be our last for the season. Traditionally, after our last meeting in the season, we would have an outing or we would go out for a meal. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to plan that at the moment but hopefully we will be able to get together for a meal before the summer. So our last meeting is going to be on Tuesday the 13th of April and the subject of the talk will be caring for one another and I'm hoping that some of, one or two of our members in our group will join me in that meeting. So, God willing, we'll see you again in April. <laughs>